Okay, so today we're going to do Asian culture. Um, and we're going to focus on three Asian countries in particular. We're going to look at Korea and China and Japan. And if you've ever looked at your, your uh, textbook, you'll see it's absolutely pathetic what they do with the Asian history. Uh, it's like one chapter. I don't even know if Korea was mentioned in the whole chapter. It was ridiculous. So I basically kind of put some things together. Now, I have been to Korea, so I use some of that. And then I want to thank Kota here. If you guys know Kota, he is from Japan. I don't know if you know that. And uh, he said, Mrs. T, I'll help you with it because I did this last fall. And he said, I'll help you with some of it. So he did the Japanese side. And actually, that's where I'm going next after Ireland because I want to go and check out Japan. So we're going to show you some of the culture stuff, too, because there's a real stereotype that all Asian countries and people are the same. And they are so different, so different. We'll see some similarities, but they are very different. And then after we do this, then we're going to look at the top 10 history events in the Asian culture. And we'll look at some of those. So we'll do kind of the fun stuff first, and then we'll get into the history. Okay? So let us begin by learning how to speak Korean. We're going to start with Korean first. Tomorrow we'll do some Japanese, and the day after that we'll do some Chinese, okay? So first we need to know how to say hello in Korean. Obviously these are not their letters, but it's so that you know how to pronounce it. So to say hello in Korean, you say, Annyeonghaseyo. Annyeonghaseyo. Want to try it with me? Ready? Annyeonghaseyo. Annyeonghaseyo. So I want you in the next day when you see each other, say, Annyeonghaseyo. 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 Now to say thank you, it's even easier. It's kamsamnida. Kamsamnida. Try it. Kamsamnida. Kamsamnida. Easy, right? And to say goodbye, it's basically the same thing as hello. They just add two little things in the middle. So instead of annyeonghaseyo, it goes annyeonghikeseyo. 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 Try it. Annyeonghikeseyo. Annyeonghikeseyo. See, you're experts already. It has actually been voted as the easiest language to learn. We'll show you actually some of the letters and stuff later. It was designed to be very easy to understand. So I'm not even joking. It actually was proven is the easiest to learn. I know it. Got too many uh, like exceptions to the rule in English, don't we? All right, so let's start out with some clothing. And you'll see in your notes... Um, it's just kind of open. You can either write, if that makes it easier, or if you like to draw, if that makes it easier for you to remember them, you can do that too. Either way, all right? So in Korea, they call these robes hanbok. And you know that all of them use robes, but you'll see that there are differences between them. Um, hanbok, I will tell you first of all, that if I looked at these two pictures, I know all of these people are royalty or upper class people. Because if you were lower class, everyone had to wear white. So in the castle, there'd be all kinds of color. And as soon as they would go out on the street, it would be all white robes everywhere. Um, and they wore black hats, like you see here in this picture. It's kind of like an Abraham Lincoln hat, only it's see-through. So that's what they would have worn out and about. This is actually the uh, robe of the king and the queen. And the reason we know that is on the front, you'll see there's the symbol of the dragon. And the dragon is a symbol of royalty in the Korean culture. Over here, you'll see I'm standing with three other teachers from around the world. And they are representing the military because they have a crane and a tiger on their front. And that was a symbol that they were a general in the military. So very aggressive. Here you'll see our whole group together, and there's some different things I want to point out to you. First of all, the wedding dress in the Korean culture of hanbok looks like what I have on here or here. You'll notice it's really colorful. They're using red with a lot of other colors. You'll notice that the sleeves are long. They go way past your hands. And then on the top of your head, I know it's kind of hard to see, but they have this little round thing that looks like a lotus flower, and it's made out of beads and you put it right on top of your head. It kind of looks funny, but it's also pretty too. So that's what a wedding dress would look like. Now I know these things look like they're from way, way back, and they are from way, way back. However, you will see people wearing hanbok walking down the street in Korea. They do still wear hanbok for special occasions, like graduations, birthday parties, things like that. 
So they do wear jeans just like you, but they also wear hand pumps. Yeah. Hanbok is the name of the robe that they're wearing. That's the total outfit. Yep. Nope, I'm glad you asked. Now, also in this picture, you'll see that there are two styles. Of course, I wanted to buy one to bring back to show you and wear, but they're like 500 bucks a piece. So I settled for buying Barbie clothes because I can afford that. So you'll see there's two different styles. The first one has a lapel in the front, and that means that you wore it in the castle because it was inappropriate to show your hands to the king or queen. You had to hide your hands. If you go outside the castle, then you could wear something like this. And that's what you see here in this second Barbie doll clothing, okay? The other thing you'll notice that makes Hanbok different from the other two countries, Hanbok has a bow that's up here. Uh, the seam is usually above the chest, and the bow is also above the chest, either in the center or on the shoulder. So the bow is up high. That's kind of the thing that they're using there, okay? Typically, when a woman gets married in Korea, they have two wedding dresses. They have hanbok, and then they have a white wedding dress as well. So they have two. Yeah. Um, why, why do they, why do they get like all those wedding dresses? You know what? I'm not sure about that, to be honest. I don't remember. I really don't remember. Hmm. Good question. I probably knew it at one time. I probably just forgot. Now, in Korea today, it was really interesting. As you're walking down the streets of Seoul, you will see as it's sun shining out, there are women that are wearing gloves. And that's because they don't want to uh, tan their faces. Now, if you think about where that comes from, why didn't they want to have a tan? It meant you were lower class, that you were an outside worker, a manual laborer. So I don't think it means that today, but it comes from way back then. Uh, plus, they also know it's bad for your skin, right? You don't want to get skin cancer. Like they said to me, they're like, oh, your, your skin is bad. <laughs> Too many years of lifeguarding, what can I say, you know? They also carry an umbrella with them at all times for both kinds of weather. It rains like a crazy person there. If you see this picture here, I mean, it can flood in 10 minutes or less. It is crazy, it pours. I had a regular umbrella with me, tore it to shreds in the first storm. I had to go buy a heavy duty one that I left there, it was crazy. Uh, but they also have nice ones for when it's sunning out so that they can protect themselves as well, okay? Now, let me show you, when a king or queen come in, just like any other culture, you need to do what? Bow. Why do we bow? Shows that you're beneath them, show respect, right? So in the Korean culture, it goes even further. You need to be flat on the floor. So here's how it works. You're in the castle, so your hands are behind your little lapel, right? And you have to kneel. So basically, the king walks in, you start by kneeling, then you shift onto one butt cheek, and then you put your forehead on the ground. Hands, so you go back up to your kneeling, and then back up. That would be a little difficult, <laughs> that would be difficult. So now it's your turn, stand up. Find an area where you can do this, and I'll have you do it together, okay? Okay. Okay, so hands under your lapel, right? Okay, the king has entered. Please kneel. Good, and then shift to one butt cheek on one side. And then put your forehead on the ground. <laughs> and you may rise. Please rise without your hands. Good job. You're doing good. <laughs> it's pretty tough, isn't it? Now, you have to remember that they did that quite a bit, so they were probably more flexible than we are. I know when my forehead goes down, my butt goes up right? But uh, that's what I would have had to do. Yeah, that's what they did. What's that? That's all right. So yeah, that's actually what they would do when the king entered the room. Good job, guys. Now, and then imagine having your um, handbok on. I was stepping on it. Oh my goodness, what a mess. Now in Japan, they use a kimono. Uh, you'll notice that they have lots of beautiful colors, a lot of different patterns. These are made out of silk because Japan is known for their beautiful silk. 
Um, now, these two that I have right here are male kimonos, and this one's kind of special for me. My grandpa fought in World War II in the Pacific, and then he was in Japan after the war to kind of keep the peace, and he brought this back, and I ended up getting it from the family. So, so the first thing you'll notice is that there is kind of a blocked front. See that there? That is a very Japanese cultured look. And I don't think the picture necessarily shows it, but it kind of comes down. For those of you at home, it kind of goes like this. Okay. Now, because this is a male kimono, it doesn't have a sash like the girls does. It just basically has a tie on it. But with a woman, they would have an obi sash. And you'll notice it uh, is kind of padded in the front. And then you have a big bow in the back like this. Very pretty. Either draw or write. You can draw it, that'll help. That's why I told you you might want to draw, because it's a little bit easier. Now, again, uh, they wear clothes just like you do, shorts, t-shirts, whatever. But on special occasions, they do wear kimonos. Um, girls, this is a big deal for you. At the age of 20, they have a coming of age ceremony. And that means you are officially a woman. And now you can begin to date and start looking for a mate for your life, stuff like that. Can you imagine not dating until you're 20? Sounds great. Sounds great. Less hustle, less hassle. I said hustle. Less hustle. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I meant hassle. I meant, I'm sorry. I meant hassle at home. I'm sorry. Don't call your parents. Okay. But yeah, it's like a, a big deal. But you know, most people in their culture aren't even thinking about dating until they're in college because they're so worried about those tests at the end of the year. And if you don't pass them, your future is affected, you know? So. Uh, most people I know from Japan said they didn't really start dating until college. And that's when they started loosening up a little bit and having fun, you know, instead of studying all the time. Now, over here, you'll see these are wedding dresses. Notice they use white, similar to us. These are more modern. Um, and most of the time, Japanese women actually rent their wedding dress because it's so expensive they can't afford it. Um, this here on her head is called a wataboshi. Wataboshi. And it's designed to hide her horns of jealousy that she might show to her husband to show that she is a gentle wife. She's not going to be like, why are you talking to that girl? You know how girls are. They don't do that, do they, Adam? Yeah, they do. Oh, man. You guys do it too, do they? <laughs> Maybe we need a little wadaboshi for guys too. Huh? Yeah. Kind of looks like a marshmallow a little bit, doesn't it? So as you can see, not everybody wears a wadaboshi, but it's pretty cool looking. I like it. You guys all got that? Uh, don't worry about royalty in Japan at this point. So you'll notice males also wear kimonos for special occasions. Like you see over here on the right, these guys were, I think, at a wedding. That's where I got those pictures from. Look at the little guy. Isn't he adorable? So cute. Now, back in the day, they did have samurai, and that's how they would have dressed over here. And when they were out of their fighting gear, they would have worn, you know, a kimono just like they do today. But of course, we have we have no samurais in Japan now because of the what restoration? The Meiji Restoration. See, you guys are so smart. Good job. In China, they call their their clothing hanfu, hanfu, and you'll notice it's a little bit different. Okay, you know, in Japan, we basically it's kind of clo closing like a robe. And then we have the sash. In Korea, we tie a bow up by our chest, right? Now here, Hanfuk has a little bit of a difference. Um, first of all, they use more of like chiffon, really light cloth that's really flowy. Um, they do a chiffon is a C H I F F O N, so that they can use a lot of draping, like you see here or here. A lot of different colors, different patterns. Really beautiful, and a lot of different ways to close the robe as well. Like up here, you've got one that's above the chest. Here, you've got one that goes at the waist. So just all kinds of different stuff for them. Men's hanfu um, is often less bright colored, of course, but they do use those beautiful silks that the Asian cultures are so known for. So you can see that there. And again, they use those for special occasions. Now, back in the day, the only people that could wear the color yellow were the emperor and his queen, because yellow was a sign of royalty. And also, look at this, 
the symbol of the dragon is a sign of royalty in China. So we do have a similarity here between Korea and China, don't we? And when we study history, you'll understand why. Because China invaded Korea way, way back, and then later on Japan invaded Korea. So they both had some influence on them. So let's take a look at the Chinese wedding traditions. I think these are so cool. They're really neat. So obviously, what color do they wear? Red, yes. And red is worn for two reasons. Number one, it's good luck. Number two, it's supposed to chase the evil, evil spirits away. So they wear red. Now you'll notice that the, the bride wears a veil, like you see here, or beads that cover her face. Obviously, we wear a veil sometimes in our culture, right? Same idea. Um, now, in the Western culture, when do we raise the veil? Before you're going to be kissed. Some people do it after dad drops you off. But either place, that's usually when we raise the veil. In their culture, they wait until the honeymoon night, and the husband is the first person to see her beautiful face on their honeymoon. So it's kind of a special moment between them instead. Ooh, that would be a little stressful, wouldn't it? Yeah. Gosh, I wonder if that's ever happened. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> now, in the South, I found out that they actually make a pair of shoes. First of all, notice it's red, of course. But then what they do is they have an embroidered pattern of either a deer or a turtle. Because those symbolize longevity of life, long life, or happiness. So I thought that was kind of unique. I mean, in America, we're basically looking for comfort or the prettiness of the shoe, aren't we, at our wedding? Uh, longevity of life, long life, or happiness? Turtle or deer, that is correct. And that's kind of, when we get to your bookmarks, we're going to be talking about a lot of symbols and what they mean and stuff, so it'll be kind of cool. Now, I know you're not going to be able to read all of this little stuff from the back of the room, but you don't need to write everything down. Just write a couple of ideas down because I thought this was so neat. I had to share it with you. So first, they have a tradition called the three letters and the six etiquette. Three letters and the six etiquette. So let's see here. Um, hmm. I'm going to have, uh, let's see here. I'm trying to decide who I should have here. Um... Heather, you and Anthony are getting married today in my class, all right? So we're going to use you guys as an example, okay? So Anthony, if you wanted to marry Heather, the first thing your family would do, your family would send three letters to Heather's family, each of them asking for her hand in marriage. Please let me marry your daughter, blah, blah, blah. And with each of those letters, you send a gift. And in fact, in all of these cultures, gifts are very important. You should always have a few on hand. Everywhere we went in Korea, whether it was a business or a house, we always gave a gift out of thanks for allowing us to stay there or visit or whatever. So, oh, well, each teacher, I went with a group of teachers, so each of us brought a gift from America. Uh, like, I, I think I brought, um, it was a clock that had Mount Rushmore uh, carved out of it. So that was my gift that I gave. And, but there's all kinds of stuff, though. I mean, I don't even remember all the different stuff we had, but. Yeah, so you always want a few gifts. So you would give three gifts, three letters, asking for a hand in marriage. At that point, you get to the six etiquette. And this is what happens. At this point, a representative of the groom's family goes to visit her family. And the first thing they do is they look at her birth date and they compare it to his birth date. Because you know how some of you like to read your horoscope and you know that certain months jive with certain months? You know what I mean? I don't know all the rules, but... Basically, they are comparing your birth dates to see if you're going to get along or not. And if your birth dates jive, they say yes. But if they don't, they say you probably shouldn't get married. Isn't that crazy? So they believe in that. Now, if the birth dates work okay, then the groom's family sends another gift to her family. And then they send another even more expensive gift to her family. This is five now. And then they finally allow the, the representative between the two families to set the wedding date. And it's chosen because that date is lucky for the couple, not because you chose it. So it's kind of interesting. It's all based on this idea that you gel, whatever. 
Then the night before, they have what's called the hair combing ceremony, and it's really very beautiful. So it's um, a moment between mom and daughter, and imagine, you know, she's giving you advice the night before your wedding, right? I'm going to use you, okay? Okay. Okay. So she's combing her hair, and each time she combs it, it means a different thing. So the first time you comb her hair, it stands for from beginning to end. The second time it represents from youth to old age. The third time represents lots of grandbabies. And then the fourth one represents a long and happy marriage. Isn't that nice? A little special moment with your wife, your, your mom and your, your daughter. It's so cool, you know? So then the day of the wedding, you would think you've jumped through all your hoops, right, Anthony? But oh no. Mm-mm. There's more to do. So on the wedding day, you and your groomsmen here, you arrive at Heather's house and you knock on the door. But she will not answer the door until you have thoroughly embarrassed yourself. And I mean literally. So you must do something to embarrass yourself. You can sing a song in the yard. You can do a dance. But when she thinks you are finally embarrassed, then she will finally let you in. And that's just you alone. The guys wait outside. When you go inside, then you and she both serve tea, a tea ceremony to her parents. Then she goes with you guys and you go to your parents' house and then you guys serve tea to your parents. And then you can finally go get married. Isn't that wild? I mean, there's just a lot of steps, aren't there? But a lot of tradition, which is kind of cool. Now, um, I don't know if this is true in our country as much, but the reception is much more important than the actual wedding in their culture because most of them might say that they're Buddhist or whatever, but they don't necessarily practice their religion. So it's more a 20 minute deal or go to the courthouse and then they go to the reception and the parents will spend so much money, they will probably be in debt for the rest of their lives. Like, oh, what's that movie on MTV? Uh, 16, Sweet 16. You ever watch that with those birthdays for those girls? And they get totally like showered with everything they want. That's the kind of reception we're talking about, like huge. Yeah, and the more dresses the girl wears, the more wealth the family has. So she can have five, six wedding dresses throughout the night, and she'll just keep going and changing into a new dress, which is kind of fun, but imagine 500 to 1,000 bucks every time you wear one, right? Crazy. And they do have some white wedding dresses as well as red when they mix. So at that point, uh, you've worn all your dresses, everything's good. I told you that red is good luck, and you'll also find that other things are red because of that. Like um, all of your gifts will be wrapped in red wrapping paper, your envelopes will be red, and even your sheets on your wedding night because they want you to have good luck in your marriage and hopefully to have grandbabies. So it's kind of an interesting tradition, isn't it? Very cool. Lots to it. Now there's also some other uh, forms of fashion that have been around a long time and they still are around, they just have kind of modernized it. Like for example, this is the Tang jacket. It is characterized by a suit coat that has dots all over it. And then if you notice in the front, it has strings that go from one button to the other button on each side, kind of like Janet Jackson 1992, you know, what it kind of looks like. And you'll see, I mean, this is modern. This is, you know, President Bush. Up here, you'll see a woman that's modernized the Tang jacket. So it's still very popular. Down in the left corner, this is the Mao suit, named after this guy right here, Mao Zedong, who is the leader of China. Uh, and he wore suit coats like this, and basically they're buttoned up to the neck, right? So they pretty much just used that and modernized it, like you see here in the guy in black. The girls, for a long time, have worn Chiang Sam, uh, which is known for showing off the beautiful curves of a woman. And it buttons from the side of the shoulder here and then down the side. It either buttons or zips down the side. And it can be short sleeve, long sleeve. The dress itself can be short or long. They just keep modernizing it and making it beautiful. And it is. I mean, those girls are gorgeous, you know. Heck, I would wear that. I would totally wear that red one. It's beautiful. Isn't she beautiful? Yeah. I don't know if I could pull it off, but it's pretty. Yeah. How are we doing? We're doing okay? Our notes? 
We're coming to that next. Yes. All right. Let's talk about a tradition in China called foot binding. Yes, it's pretty gross, isn't it? So here's what's going on. They are basically trying to fit their foot in a three-inch shoe. Think about three inches. Oh, my gosh. In fact, that thing that Oprah is holding on her finger is a shoe. That's their shoe. And this is an adult, not a child. These are adult feet that you see here in this picture. So this is how it works. Um, I need a girl with sandals on. Here, can you put your foot up for me up here? Just take your sandal off and just put it up here for a sec. Are you ticklish? A little bit? Okay, so this is what happens. When you are still a little girl before you've grown up, I mean the age of one or two, your mom will first break your toes by bending them in like this. And then they take and they push your toes down to your heel. So you're almost a sandwich. And they break all the bones in the arch of your foot. When they break those bones, they then take your foot and they wrap it with wrap until the bones heal so that your foot looks like a U, like you see there in the picture. Yeah. The reason? Because this is the way to catch the wealthy guy, the good-looking guy in town. Because a woman that had small feet was considered beautiful and dainty and graceful. So you don't want big feet in their culture. <laughs> Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. But it was a sign of beauty. It was. So this basically just tells you what I just said. That they broke the bones in their feet. Now they, they claim that they're moving it into the shape of a lotus flower. I don't think that's a lotus flower, but okay, whatever. Um, and as we said, they're trying to fit into three inch shoes. Now, as you can imagine, uh, as Americans, we're looking at this going, are you nuts? This is crazy. So in 1912, they basically outlawed foot binding. But the problem was, okay, you could pass a law, but remember, China is huge, right? It's a, like, what, a fifth of the world? So these people in small towns like Brandon up in the mountains, they still are wanting to impress that guy in Brandon. So they're still using foot binding to catch the good-looking guy or the wealthy guy in town. So there are still women that have those tiny little feet like that. Yeah. It does. I know. Yeah. When she get, like, really yeah. Yeah, and that's why you'll see in, in China, women would often walk like this, right? I mean, think about what you're walking on. You're walking on basically your broken toes and your heel, you know? Yeah. Okay, now I agree with you. I think this is absolutely crazy and gross, but now I want to tell you something. When I went to get this picture, guess what picture was right next to it? A picture of a, an American woman wearing heels. Do any of you wear those nice big three inch heels to prom homecoming? Yes. Ladies, why do we wear heels? To, to be taller, power over men, or to make us look sexy, right? With our beautiful legs, right? Do we not? Yeah. 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 Let's be honest. We do it for the same reason, right? To make us look nice. Yeah. And you know, they took an x-ray of this woman who had worn heels her entire life, and it showed how they had messed up her bones in her foot because she was wearing heels every day. Are they comfortable, ladies? Three, three inch heels, seriously? Comfortable? There, thank you for being honest, Kayla. Yeah, they suck. They, they are very painful. So the only reason we're doing it is to look pretty, right? Yeah, of course, or tower over men, as you said. You know, yeah. So, are we maybe not doing the same thing? No, we're not breaking our feet. True. Maybe not quite that extreme that we're breaking feet, but but we are wearing very uncomfortable shoes just to look pretty, right? <laughs> That's true. They didn't choose to get their toes broken, right? Mama did it. Good point. Just to let you think about that, okay? Yeah. So now that you are completely grossed out, let's talk about food. Yeah. All right. So obviously in Korea, being a peninsula into the sea, right, lots of seafood, right? And you can get it on the market, fresh, you know, like octopus, squid, whatever. Um, or you can go to the little mom and pop restaurants, and they'll have fish tanks in the front, 
and you can actually pick out live which one you want. So you can say, I want that eel, and it'll, they'll pull it out, kick it and scream it, and they bring it to your table, and there's a hot plate at your table. They zap it to stun it, and then they chop it up, and you eat it right there. It's something else, man. It's really interesting. That is exactly why I put that picture there. I just found out from someone in the last class, she thinks she knows what it is. Uh, she said it's a type of eel. I, they look like swimming hot dogs. Okay. It was crazy. No eyes, no fins, just a hot dog with a mouth that went like this. It was crazy, man. It was so weird. Yeah, I never seen it, but very interesting. You'll also notice that, uh, first of all, they do sit on the floor on pillows, typically. They do have Western tables if you want them, but most people choose to sit on the floor. It's more comfortable. Um, and you'll see that there are dishes everywhere. Uh, you put your food dishes in the middle, and then you take your chopsticks and you bring the food to your plate, whatever you choose to eat. Uh, probably 30 dishes by the time you're done, because they're little tiny dishes. Uh, no, in fact, we'll talk about that in just a minute. The big staple in Korea is kimchi. That is like what you eat with every meal, and it is pickled spicy cabbage. They wait until that cabbage crop is done, and they buy it by the truckload. And behind every house, you will see these big vats that you, you see here on the right, and they're filled with pickled cabbage so that they have stock for the entire year. Um, I personally never really enjoyed it. All three of these here on the left are different styles of cabbage. Every family has their own recipe. Some of them are really hot spicy. Some of them are sour like a pickle. So it just kind of depends. I didn't like the texture because it's kind of like uh, wet spinach. You know what I mean? So I really wasn't into it very much, but I tried it. Potatoes, maybe? Potatoes, chips, steak. <laughs> steak. But you know, usually with our meat, we have potatoes, especially in the Midwest. There they eat kimchi. What's that? It's a side, yeah, yeah, like a salad kind of. They have lots of fruit as well. So you'll see, you know, they don't have big high V's like we do. They have small shops like this out on the street. Um, their desserts, they are not used to the sweets like we are. In fact, I was craving a candy bar all the time. I had to go to the gas station to get chocolate. Um, most of their, their uh, dessert is fruit, like watermelon or fruit with some yogurt on it. This was, I think, a cheesecake with one thing of chocolate on it. So it's pretty simple. Well, I will tell you, I was there for two weeks and I lost 10 pounds because it is so healthy and plus you're, you're walking everywhere. You know, most people don't have cars. That's why they don't have drive throughs They may have a couple McDonald's or things like that, but most people use the subway or things, or they walk. So yeah, it's good for you. Really good food for you too. And most of it is steamed, right? So, you know, they're not frying stuff like we do. Right? Plus, it slows you down so you can tell when you're getting full, right? Sometimes we eat so fast like our lunches. Oh my gosh, how fast is our lunch, right? It's ridiculous. It trains us to eat very bad. We're not listening to our body going, oh, I am full. We just shove it down, you know? So you're right. It slows things down a little bit. Here's just some other different foods that we ate while we were there. So oysters. Looks like uh, sushi a little bit. Yep. <laughs> Oh, in Japan, we have a couple of things that are pretty common. Of course, rice is gohan. We have rice with almost every meal in Japan. Oshiru is soup. Okazu is fish and vegetables. I think, uh, let's see, this one is donburimono. And this is rice on the bottom with some kind of meat on top. Uh, in this case, they use tendon, which is fried shrimp. And then you kind of break it up. So they do do some frying here. This, I think, was Kota's favorite. It's called gyoron, and it's beef with rice. So, good stuff. I think so, yes. I think it was a misprint, actually. Yeah, so it should be gyoron. I think that's pronounced correctly. Not like that. We also stole a couple of things from Japan, like our ramen noodles. You like those, Jordan? Yeah, that came from Japan. And sushi also comes from Japan. So one thing that Kocha wanted to make very clear to you is that they don't eat sushi every day. 
it's only on special occasions. So, you know, if you do really good on a test or you have a birthday or graduation, then they would eat sushi. It's a very special thing. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> he said, so every day they eat it because they always do good in class. That's what he was saying in there. I love it. <laughs> now, as I told you, this food is so good for you that you're losing weight. But the problem is, sumo wrestlers do not want to lose weight. They want to gain weight because they've got to be the bigger guy. So they eat what's called chankanabe, which is basically a stew of protein. As much meat as they can stand, they put in that pot and they eat it at a regular regimen because they have to gain weight every time. That's the goal. Now, what is the goal of sumo wrestling? What are they trying to do? Push you out of the ring or push you on your butt, right? So I thought this was really funny. Some sumo wrestlers, they eat chankanabe, but they will not eat fish or cow. Because in sumo wrestling, if you get hit, like pushed to your butt, it means you're losing, right? So they will only eat animals that stand on two feet, like chicken. Whereas fish lays down, cows are on four feet, so they won't eat cow either. They'll only eat chicken because it stands up. I thought that was really funny. Genius? Yeah. Now, a lot of times we associate everybody in China eats certain kinds of food. But you have to remember that China is one fifth of the world, right? And depends on where you live, what they eat. So it's very regional. Um, if you are in southern China, they have a lot of rice patties. So they eat rice with every meal. Whereas in northern China, they have wheat fields. So they prefer either bread or noodles with all of their meals, which I guess I never really realized. I mean, I knew they had both, but I didn't realize it was a regional thing. It's always like rice and lo mein. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one of the most popular kinds of bread is mantu. It's kind of a, a sweet bread, and you dip it in frosting. Try that if you get a chance. You don't like sweet stuff? It's basically like uh, cinnamon rolls. It's really what it is. Only softer bread. Now, for breakfast, they would eat similar things like donuts, like us, but then they change a little bit. They eat rice porridge and even chicken noodle soup for breakfast. Isn't that unique? I suppose the rice porridge is kind of like eating oatmeal, maybe. Similar. Or grits down south, right? You guys ever had grits? You don't like them? I like them. You got to put something with it, yeah. I put sugar in it. I like it with sugar. What was what? Oh, manta is steamed bread, yeah. Now for lunch, you know, again, we've stolen some of these things. Uh, they might eat egg rolls, which are fried, so these aren't necessarily good for you, or uh, stuffed dumplings. Do you remember, uh, what's it called? Kung Fu Panda. Remember he was always trying to get the dumplings? And that's what he was trying to eat over here on the right. They're basically these little clumps of bread. They're really good. Call it bao or baozi. It's making me really hungry today. Yeah, you should have seen me fourth hour. I was ready to eat my fingers off up here. What's that? They usually eat uh, bamboo, don't they? Yeah. Now, this is another example of regional food in China. Um, there's a, a style of food called Cantonese. Um, they're usually in Guangdong province in China. They are the ones that eat stir fry. I always thought that was a whole China thing, but that is a Cantonese thing. They're also the ones that came up with wonton soup, if you've ever had that. That's one of their characteristics. And they also eat suckling pig, which we don't eat very often, I don't think. There it is. And this is it broken up here above. Um, in Hawaii, you have suckling pig. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Now, as you can tell, I've been kind of pointing out how things are different in their different cultures, and they are even different down to their chopsticks. Maybe you didn't know that, so let's take a look. Japan, you'll notice, has shorter chopsticks made of wood, and they have a pointed end on there, and it's because when they eat, they bring the bowl up to their mouth. So they really don't need long sticks because it's right here by their mouth. The other thing is remember that they are eating fish, which is really easy to tear. So they don't need anything really difficult to kind of tear that stuff up. 
in Korea, they use steel chopsticks. I didn't know that until I went there. It was really interesting. Um, first of all, because they need something stronger to tear up things like kimchi, you know, it's kind of difficult to tear that stuff up. And in their culture, they use a spoon for their rice. It's kind of a round spoon, like, um, like a soup spoon. In China, they use wood chopsticks that are longer and they are square, primarily because, I mean, half of the country eats rice. And so they basically scoop it up and bring it to their mouth. Plus, they leave the bowl on the table so it's longer so that it can reach from the table to their mouth. So they each have their own needs. Kind of cool, huh? So let's take a look at religion a little bit. Uh, Korea's number one religion, if you were to guess, it's actually Christianity. Isn't that interesting? I would never have guessed that. If you add Protestant and Catholic together, which are both Christian, it is the largest group in Korea. We've had a lot of influence because America was over there since the Korean War. And um, so a lot of Protestants, a lot of Catholics. The next one would be Buddhist. Most people consider themselves non-religious at all in Korea. Kind of interesting. This is a picture of the largest Protestant church in Korea. We went there and it was so interesting. Um, it was huge. They had a full orchestra, 30 person choir, it was huge. And we walked in and they were singing songs that everybody would know like, um, Jesus loves me or something. And on the screen, they had it translated in eight different languages. It was so cool. And then when we sat down, they gave us headphones and you plugged into the pew and they had translators for eight different languages. So you could hear the sermon in whatever language you spoke. It was really cool. One of the things you will see, however, um, in Korea or Japan is that it's about the group ahead of the individual. I mean, that's why we dealt with kamikazes in World War II because they were taught that the cause of the group was more important than one single life. And uh, you'll see that quite often in both cultures. Yeah.